runner's toolbox, seven problems, Achilles tendonitis, ankle sprains, flat foot, plantar fasciitis, IT band syndrome, patella femoral pain syndrome, and stress fracture. So here's seven solutions. KOT calf raise, FHL calf raise, and straight leg calf raise. Slow and controlled ankle rolls, going clockwise, counterclockwise, up and down continuously, and tibialis posterior strengthening in open chain and closed chain. Progressive overload to tibialis anterior strength. For flat foot, we have reverse walking, tibialis raise, barefoot walking, and intrinsic foot strengthening. Plantar fasciitis, beware of restrictive footwear. IT band, we have the reverse hip thrust, piriformis push up, couch quad stretch, and couch hip flexor stretch, and the ATG split squat. For patella femoral syndrome, the goal is progressive loading in shallow knee bend, as you can tolerate pain-free, to deeper knee bend as symptoms resolve to ensure you're causing adaptation. Now isometric holds and band flossing can be used early on to mitigate functional loss as you recover. Definitely want to ensure that we are not staying in band-aid mode and get the body to trust those positions that were once aggravating and rebuild to higher levels of ability. Now for stress fractures, you're going to have to take some rest, six to eight weeks depending on the individual, following rehabilitative protocols as suits your clinical situation. But to protect from shin splints, a good rule of thumb is strengthen the muscles through length on the front of the shin, on the back of the shin, to decrease internal tension that could be placing unwanted aberrant forces on the bone with each plotting step that you take during your running stride. So as a bonus, I'm also going to give you a gait cycle checklist to look at as a runner, even if you're not dealing with any of these seven issues, but just want to augment your athletic potential. So when we run, we experience two primary phases of gait, an absorption phase and a propulsion phase, meaning the body is absorbing forces from itself and the momentum generated from those forces facilitates each additional stride. You're going to be able to propel yourself out of each stride that you take. You need to be able to function optimally internally so you don't have anything holding you back. There's also a rotary component to running, which is facilitated by the spinal engine and fascial interconnections between the lats and the glutes. And oftentimes sore shoulders or hamstrings result simply because of a lack of rotational ability in your spine. So your main hip muscles involved in running will be the glutes, TFL, and adductors. And from a performance standpoint, we need to look at the common bony attachments of those muscles if we're going to be able to effectively program exercises that can decrease internal tension and increase external ability. Two things to consider for each of these groups that I go through. I'm gonna go through hip, knee, and ankle. If the joint is restricted, you're going to have less ability. And if the tissues that connect to the joint are restricted, you're going to have less ability. So for the hip, if Alfred's gonna be able to function optimally in his run, he needs to be able to move his hip through flexion and extension without any issue. The primary means of facilitating this will be motion of the head of the hip in its capsule. Oftentimes with restricted postures, sitting, this hip joint can become taut and restricted and oftentimes posterior hip capsule is what loses its freedom. What I like to use on the ATG Science Blueprint is a posterior hip capsule active mobilization called the reverse hip thrust. And I think Alfred's hip is not working on this side. He did do some acrobatics in the last video, so I'm going to turn him to the other side for this demonstration. So with the reverse hip thrust in particular, what we're looking to do is to get posterior hip capsule mobilization by thrusting the hips back behind the heels. When you do this with load, the tension is increased and as is adaptation. When applying this to running, if we don't have optimal hip arthrokinematics, which is bone moving on the bone, more wasted energy and an increase in demand from the body. Now for the muscles of that area, if you still have weak glutes on top of a restricted hip, you want to use a single leg back extension with resistance band attachment on the bottom because what this is going to do is increase tension at the top position which is where glute activation is the highest. For the tissues of the groin, I would focus on ATG split squat and seated good morning progressions to open up tissues that could be limiting internal and external rotation of the hip. Yes, I did a wardrobe change and it's not exactly the same as it was before because it's now tomorrow. By finishing the gait cycle hip progression, we want to focus on getting neural tension out of the obturator nerve with the seated pancake progression, which can be used as a post-run stretch. Now let me get Alfred to explain the progression I would use for the knee joint. He did his acrobatics. He didn't really hurt his knee, so I should be able to move this quite easily. But the main muscles involved at the knee joint for running are the quadriceps, 
and the hamstring muscles. The common joint for both of these muscles is the tibiofemoral joint. The tibia being the lower leg bone, femur bone, the top bone. So what would I do if I had a restricted knee joint? The goal would be to open up the joint capsule with the ATG split squat. If I had weak hamstrings, I would try to get greater eccentric control with the Nordic hamstring curl. If I had a runner with tight hamstrings, I would want them to get exceptionally good at the reverse RDL. Because what this is going to do is opening up their proximal attachment, making the distal attachment less taut. For weak quads, I would go VMO squat. Tight quads, I would try to progress them in the reverse Nordic. As far as neural tension is concerned, one that everyone is focused on is that sciatic nerve that runs down the posterior chain. And we use the elephant walk to alleviate fascial restrictions on those nerves. For the front side, you want to focus on the femoral nerve which runs alongside the anterior chain of the body, and using the couch stretch will handle that one. And then quite simply, if you have weak or tight calves, or weak or tight tibialis, you just do raises in both of those, loading them progressively to a point that you can tolerate pain-free. And at the lateral ankle, we want to alleviate internal tension on the nerves around this ankle, which we can facilitate with ankle circles. And finally, to get that diagonal torso motion, you have to be able to dissociate your collarbone and your pelvis in relation to opposing motions. I have a few exercises on the ATG Science Blueprint that helps to get you this diagonal motion in a scalable fashion. If you have any questions about sets, reps, days of week, and other information in regards to programming details for any of these solutions to your current running regimen, feel free to shoot me a DM. I'd love to talk you through it. So I figured it would make sense to just give you all these solutions first before giving you all the scientific rationale for these movements. But now I'm going to give you the why behind the runner's toolbox. So for ankle sprains, this is probably the most exciting why. I managed to find the study that progressively overloaded the tibialis and lateral ankle muscles and tested for muscle growth, strength, and resistance to ankle sprain. So some interesting tidbits. When you, all right, let me get him. When you sprain an ankle, what can happen is arthrogenic muscle inhibition. Basically, that means that the muscles surrounding a joint, even if those muscles are not directly injured, they're not able to become activated due to the injury at that joint. In this case, the ankle joint specifically induces decreases in activation potential in the soleus muscle, which is the deeper of the gastroc and soleus muscles respectively. These decreases even last after pain symptoms subside. What's the application of that? The issue is people will jump right back into their sport after rolling an ankle and resting it for a few days, icing it, what have you, and thinking that just because there's no pain that they're able to get back into their sporting activities and function without any issue. And that's where you get this recurrence of chronic ankle sprain because you're not dealing with the root of the issue, which is a lack of literal joint ability affecting literal muscle ability. So this study in particular used exercises with special devices designed to progressively overload ankle tendons for 10 weeks, three times a week with eight to 10 reps to failure. Aberrant forces at the ankle decreased as a result of this training. Lateral ankle tendons demonstrated increases in muscle thickness and strength as did tibialis anterior. We need to consider Hooke's law to really conceptualize the benefits here. Hooke's law basically says that a certain force only leads to half displacement if springs in the muscle were doubled. Let's say we have 200 pounds of ankle force per a foot strike leading to 100% of an ankle tear. If we double the amount of muscle, we would get 50% of an ankle tear. Double that, we get 25% of an ankle tear. Double that, we get 12.5% of an ankle tear. So you can see how exponentially increasing the amount of muscle strength and volume would decrease the amount of displacement of those tendons of the joint according to Hooke's law. You can get functional improvement and muscular hypertrophy in the ankle muscles themselves with progressive overload, much like is used on the ATG system with the tibialis raise and ankle circle progressions respectively. Another study found that the interosseous membrane actually moves proportionally in accordance to the strength in the front and the strength in the back, the tibialis anterior and the tibialis posterior respectively. And they found that it actually has nociceptors, which are pain receptors in the leg. If you have less of an ability to pick up your shin on the front and less muscle in that area, you could actually put undue strain and stress on the shins and potentially be a reason for shin splints. The greater strength balance we get in the front, the more effective contraction we get in the back. The tibialis posterior is crucial to be able to maintain an arch with each and every step that you take in your running stride. So tibialis anterior strength allows you to more effectively utilize tibialis posterior at a length that is conducive to functional activity. Plantar fasciitis and flat feet, the solutions for these are remarkably similar. The plantar fascia is made up of structure of fibrous and dense tissue adapted from the forces placed around it from the intrinsic and extrinsic muscular attachments. An important mechanism to consider is the windlass mechanism, and this occurs in dorsiflexion just before propulsion. And let me get him again to show you what that means. So right before you start to get into that 
propulsion phase where you propel your foot behind you, your foot gets into a little bit of dorsiflexion and that will stretch the plantar fascia. Plantar flexors wrap around the big toe to raise the arch and provide a mechanism of support for that propulsive phase and the subsequent movement. You can imagine that any weak or tight link along this fascial chain can lead to issues in this mechanism and become a risk factor for plantar fasciitis. There's countless research studies showing the benefit of short foot exercises for improving upon the arch of the foot, while backwards walking has actually shown to increase lower leg motor unit activation, strength, foot posture, and foot alignment in long distance runners. Conceptually, it makes sense. As you go back in reverse, you're stabilizing all of your body weight functionally on the pad of your foot which is literally mimicking that windlass mechanism and forcing you to be able to create an arch with your entire body weight on your foot. A no-brainer to add to a runner's repertoire. Okay, almost done. IT band. This is a fascial tissue that runs down to the bottom of the knee. So why didn't I give you foam rolling? Those techniques don't offer nearly as much input to cause that adaptation for one, and for two, this issue is a compressive issue, meaning the pain is resulting from compression at one area. Considerable attention being to the fat pad that lies underneath the IT band, and it's thought that because of innervation at that fat pad and compression from the IT band, that's where your pain is getting most of the issues at. So this is why I added decompressive techniques for the joint above, the tissues around, and the nerves behind. Being able to decompress the tissue around the posterior chain is important for that functional activity because with each and every single step that you take in your running stride, if you don't have the ability to have fluid, elastic rebound from hip, knee and ankle going to get some issues somewhere due to compression. Next one is patellofemoral pain syndrome. This is the dreaded runner's knee and oftentimes this can be an issue facilitated by that increase in IT band tension on the lateral knee. It can affect kneecap tracking and as you can see with Alfred his kneecap does not track very good at all because he is also just a skeleton. The issue can also come about with strength deficits at the hip and knee. Decrease in ankle dorsiflexion, a decrease in trunk strength, and an inability to stabilize the pelvis on one leg. Oftentimes the femurs are rotated inward, foot is collapsed, and tightnesses of the quad, hamstring, and hip flexor are present placing more tension on the kneecap that it could tolerate hence the predisposition to pain. Specific adaptation to impose demand. If you want to improve the ability in the patellofemoral joint, you got to progressively load that joint according to what you could tolerate. Now, if you're having acute symptomology and literally little knee bend is causing you issues, then go to the other direction, start working the hip, and then progressively reintroduce knee bend as you can tolerate because it's well known that deep knee bend aggravates this the most because the kneecap has to move the most in these deep knee band positions. Doesn't make it wrong, it means you have to introduce what you can tolerate and progress to that point so that you're not avoiding the issue. I would not be one to say that you should avoid deep knee bend for this issue, but I would say you want to progressively overload what you can tolerate in each working range of the knee before you get to that point, and once you get to that point, don't fear knee bend, progressively load that too. This is why we want full range on these lower leg exercises. Running and jumping are activities that have immense external forces, and if our internal structure cannot handle it, you exponentially increase the chance of injury. We just came out with a program on the ATG app that incorporates all of these movements called the ATG Science Blueprint. It's a living program that will continually be refined as I find more effective progressions and exercises for increasing pain-free athletic ability regardless of the activity. Check the description below for my Instagram account and a link to the ATG program. Feel free to shoot me a DM with any questions you may have and as always recommend me topics for future videos and I'll add them to my list and post as I find the time. Thanks.